Freiburg goes for the kill, he's going to pick it up, if just exists the match, he's going to win the round, there's no time! Oh my god, Freiburg, are you kidding me? Because I'm Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of By The Numbers. I'm your host Richard Lewis. With me as always every week is Duncan Thorin Shields, currently in Korea. I think ever since we've done this show, I don't know if you've been in the same place twice, have you? It's ridiculous. Uh, what are you doing I like out there? I to move then? around. So I'm just living here for a few months, enjoying myself. G- generally how it works is the mail order brides are supposed to come to you, mate. You're not supposed to go. Yeah, there. but I'm, I'm cutting costs. It's all about efficiency, you know. You know. <laughs> also, oh, maybe like- I like... I like to play away from home, even on my mail order brides. You know, I like to have two or three. Mate, just live it large with that with that esports dollar. Um, but anyway, look, there's loads to go into today. It's an action-packed uh, week of CS. Uh, we've we've uh, got so much to cover. So I guess we'll probably start uh, with uh, Navi uh, winning Star Series. Uh, this is obviously again something that I've been quite happy about you know i've been plugging navi for a while as you well know you've had to cope with me constantly bigging them up as a, a new potential top team candidate and of course they did go up against envious in the final um now i know obviously cis teams have had a great you know great run at uh, star series star ladder events uh, that just goes without saying they're on home soil some people have even inferred that admins and scheduling and all that tends to favor them Far be it from me to uh, buy into that mythology, but um, Navi, they played, uh, they've, they've played and beat one of the top teams in Europe in a final and did so in convincing fashion. So I'll start there. Did you watch the final? And if so, what did you make of Navi's performance overall? Yeah, I mean, actually, this was the event where I think this was probably the best event Navi's ever played overall because. They've had other events where they played close to this level. Like, I actually thought, amazingly, even the one where they only made the semi of the last Gfinity, they played pretty well. Like, both the maps against Virtus Pro were very close. It's just at the time, Virtus Pro, I mean, they're very good in, they're very good at closing games out. So they maybe had a little bit extra than them there. But I thought they could have made a final at that event already. At this last event, the, uh, the DreamHack one before, rather, they obviously did make the final, thanks to upsetting Nip in the group. And in the final there, admittedly, Fnatic kind of ran away with the first map, so yeah. not as great there. But the, the second one was close, so they've shown these signs at all times. It is true that, obviously, there was no Fnatic here, there was no TSM. Envious was the main foil. But actually, I think that, that has to count in Na'Vi's favor, because when I looked at the lineup for this event, I was thinking the other way. Like, well, if you're envious and everyone's been saying you've been slumping, you have to win this event. Like, look at the field. Like, this this should be one where you gather it up and everyone says, ah, but there was no Fnatic and TSM, right? You've got that one. That's like kind of like, it's almost like protecting home court, you know, in that scenario. It's like, you have to win that one. So to be envious in a best of five, that's very impressive. Like, no matter what form envious is in, because... They were one of those teams where we used to say it's almost unfair to play them in a best of five. They've got too many maps they're good at. They're too they're too evenly spread across the map pool. And so if you can win a best of five across them, and they won it three to one, it's not like they won it like three to two and it was super close. No, yeah, there was one map was super close, but I don't know, Navi was the, the best team in this tournament, it was clear. Yeah, so let's talk a little bit about the final and how it went down and what it tells us about this current uh, Navi team. Uh, and then we'll get on to the problems that Envious are experiencing. I know, again, they were bitterly disappointed not to win this one. But um, first up, the crisis of confidence that Na'Vi are having on Dust2 continues. They lost uh, twice on, on Dust2 uh, to, to Envious at this event. Uh, yeah. They lost uh, 16-10, and I think it was 16-12, I think it was the other one, in uh, the, the earlier stages of the tournament. Um, <clears throat> this used to be a map that was pretty much home turf for Na'Vi. Guardian in particular was uh, excellent on this map. He has been ever since CSS. And they lost one game. It was at Fragbite. And then Na'Vi all of a sudden was saying, oh, and it was against Fnatic. And they're saying, hey, we got figured out on this. Teams know how to neutralize us on this map now. Guardian's getting shut down all the time. And since then, I don't think they've won a competitive game on Dust2. Uh, now, you know, when they, when they haven't banned it out so they don't have to play it. Now, is this... A psychological thing is this 
actually the, the, the team has been found out? Have Has the meta shifted? So teams are playing Dust2 in a way that was different to when Na'Vi were a dominant force on this map. What's going on? Yeah, that's the thing. I don't really buy that. Like, I think it is just a thing. Teams do this themselves. I've, I Put it this way, Fnatic themselves did it on Inferno, which to this day, statistically, they have an unreal record on offline. There's certain teams they won't play on Inferno, even though I think they would probably beat them, you know. When teams get it in their head that this map doesn't work for us or they blame a, a certain key loss on, like, we can't play that map anymore... I think there's like a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy where if they then have to play it, they also kind of then don't play to their max level because like, well, if they're kind of defeated already, you know. So I don't buy the idea that someone's figured out how to shot Guardian down. Like what's funny is in CSGO especially, there's, if there's one position you can't shut down, it's really dominant AWPers. Like they can go to those positions and it's very difficult to smoke them off, flash them off. If you could do that, we'd, we'd have shut down all these guys years ago. Kenny S, all the rest of them. Yeah, They'd have yeah. to be switching position every map, you know. I think usually... Like, I, I don't buy that you can shut down Guardian, especially because in the new Na'Vi, it's not just Guardian anymore. It's one thing when it was just Guardian on Dust2 and he had, he had to win the whole map himself. Now you've got Flamey, now you've got Edward, now you've got Seize, now you've got all these players who have crazy games themselves. So if anything, I don't really, but I think if anything, they could be as good or better on Dust2 even maybe. With that said, losing to Envious isn't that bad because Envious are a very good Dust Two team. So I don't, I don't really take that as like a sign that they can't play it anymore. I think I'm kind of going with your angle of like it's psychological. I think. Yeah, uh, it definitely feels that way. Uh, you know, but that said, the the Lord giveth and the Lord uh, taketh away. Uh, you know, they've took, they've lost Dust Two, and uh, they've seemed to now have nailed down other maps quite convincingly. So. Right now, I think there's a real argument to say with Fnatic losing uh, form on this particular map, there's a real argument to say that Na'Vi are, are, are the team that have mastered Cobble perhaps better than anyone else. Again, you maybe agree or disagree. Well, the, f the funny thing was in the group of this tournament, they actually lost to Gamers 2 on that map. But in yeah. general, I think they have been very good on that. That's true. That is probably one of their home maps now. What's funny is the two that I think they've gotten really good at is that and Overpass. Yeah. Like, for some reason on Overpass, they're particularly good, especially because I've seen them play it well against TSM, and TSM is very good on that map now. So I think those two, that's where they've shifted to, whereas the old school Na'Vi was just Dust 2, Mirage, and then a little bit of Inferno. That used to be their problem was they didn't have a very good map pool. They only had, like, they, they basically had to win their map, and then you'd ban out the other good one. Like, they'd either get Dust 2 or Mirage, and then they'd have to hope that they could win, like, a, a 40, 60, 50, 50 Inferno, and they, they wouldn't do it most of the time because the numbers tell you they're not going to win most of those, you know. So I think the new Na'Vi, it's true. When you add in some of these maps, and obviously I think just seeing Train against Fnatic, uh, DreamHack will make people be more worried about that. People will ban that. So that's almost giving you a free advantage in the ban phase. So yeah. I think actually... If I were them, that's why I'd go back to Dust 2 as well, just to round that things out at that point. Like at that point, it doesn't even have to be your best map. It can be like your fourth best map, and you you're just gonna that's what's gonna make you an elite level team, you know. Mm. And they're pretty good on Inferno as well, which was the third map they managed to win against Envious. Uh, they've had some notable results on that. You know, yeah, they lost the TSM at, at Fragbite, but they were 15, 13 up at one point. Carrigan made a sick one uh, v two clutch. Uh, pretty much kept TSM in it, and then obviously Na'Vi lose the overtime. They beat Envious in overtime on the same map. That also seems to be a map where they're really starting to have some joy. So they've definitely become more fleshed out as a team, I feel. They, they're starting to feel more complete. Like before, they had talent, but it wasn't quite clicking. They, they obviously brought Flamey in. That wasn't quite working. They didn't have a particularly deep map pool. That's changed. So uh, is there an argument now? I mean, where would you put them in your rankings if we were doing them today? Well, I literally did my rankings on Monday and I actually moved Na'Vi up. Like, I think I moved Na'Vi to fourth. So I moved them above yeah. Virtus Pro, I believe. I edged them above. Because actually, when you look at it, it sounds crazy to say they can be above Virtus Pro. Because obviously Virtus Pro, like, won ESEA not that long ago. They've won yeah. two events. They've had a bunch of top fours. They've attended, like, almost as many events, maybe the most events of anyone this year. But when you actually did look at, like, which events teams had won... Well, Navi's two event victories are actually pretty stacked events. So I think I, I gave the edge on those factors. And actually, Navi now is in a position where they've now started to build up a good... Like, one of my secondary factors I always take into account is how many best of threes you've won over, like, top-ranked yeah. teams. And they're now starting to rack those up, you know. Before, like I said, their problem was always that they used to play close in those games, but they, they wouldn't actually get, like, a result to give you, like, yeah, I won that game. Now they're starting to rack them up, obviously. So they've beaten Titan a bunch of times. Now, now they've beaten Envious in a best of five. This is pretty big-time stuff at this point.
Yeah. Um, so let's talk about Envious. So from one team moving upwards to a team arguably moving downwards. Now, I know you're a big fan of Envious. You have a thing for French Counter-Strike. I can kind of understand it a little bit. You know, the, the flamboyancy, the, yeah, yeah. the, the uh, ar- almost arrogance that you get from... I love from, it. Yeah, yeah, from the, the cavalier French. approach, you know. Yeah, That, that kind of like je ne sais quoi of like, <laughs> I can just do whatever I want. I can be drunk while playing. Maybe I'll still beat you because I play like, I play like art, not science, you know. I, I love that, Rich. Unfortunately, it's not that it's not actually that great at winning Counter Strike. Usually, yeah, to win Counter Strike, you need to re- you need to be a really boring Swedish guy who like has no social life and he's just like I like to play Counter Strike a lot, and <laughs> I don't want to be the star. I just want to be in a team that works as a machine. I am not an individual. Like you know, it's the opposite of my ethos, basically. It, it, it's kind of like a microcosm of what's going on in Rocky Four, isn't it? It's it's like you know you, you describe an Ivan Drago, uh, but um, look, I I think. At this juncture, we need to start addressing the French elephant in the room, and that is that uh, Envious haven't looked like a team that's capable of winning an event uh, when other top teams are there for for a while. I know they've had a very good run in the ESL, ESEA Pro League, which we'll come to a little bit later in the show, but this is uh, a, a team that is absolutely misfiring, and shocks went absolute god mode at this tournament, yep. and they still couldn't win. So what is wrong with Envious? That's actually the most disappointing factor if you're an Envious fan, is that, okay, what's interesting is even through their ups and downs, Kiyoshima has remained very consistent. I have to give him a lot of plaudits for how well he's played over the last you know, three or four months in a row. He's been very good. And then Happy sort of rejo- – he had a little revival where he, he looked like he was that player again, that all-around talent who just always would get the kills. But what's crazy is the last sort of two months, Shox has just been like top of the scoreboard every time. And if you're an Envious fan, that's the one thing you never saw from Envious, remember? Like in the early days when they first became that top LDLC team, we always used to be like, this is amazing. How are they winning tournaments or how are they placing top placing without Shox being the best? So if you're an old Very Games fan, the idea was if Shox ever went in a god mode again, well, would these pieces around? him they'd be the best team in the world you know well actually at the moment he's he's playing the best he's maybe ever played in their team and yeah like you say they're not going to win an event right now if any if at the moment if four teams are there if like navi vp fanatic tsm so this is crazy. it's not just fanatic in their way anymore and so if if as harsh as it sounds i think you have to put some of the blame onto the the people that we're not mentioning at the moment now so smiths nbk i think they have to have some factor in in why the team isn't isn't able to do it when some of these other players are playing some of the best CS they've ever played. Mm. Um, well, look, I I just want to call you out a little bit on something you said. Uh, I, I did catch the final, um, and you know I I agree with what you're saying in general about Kiyoshima, but he was missing in in the final. I, I felt I, I didn't think he could played particularly well he was statistically the weakest player uh overall on on the team and kept getting caught out a little bit was quite easily picked on a number of occasions to give uh, navi entrance you know entrance to the, the, the sites so yeah. is is there uh i mean i know obviously you're not going to have it but just as a counter argument is there something to say well you know kirishima might be mr consistent in the games that don't matter but has he got some form of mental block when it comes to finals and and crunch games. No, I mean, when I said about Kiyoshima, I more meant like over the last three months, his general form has been the really consistent one of the team. Like if I know someone's going to, like for example, when I do Alpha Draft, that he's the guy I nearly always take because like he's my first one I take from their team. Then I decide between Happy and Shocks, you know, like who do I think is going to have a good game against this sort of opponent. So Kiyoshima, it's true in that final, he didn't do a whole lot. He, if he'd have even turned up as normal, maybe they'd even have got that to five maps. But the final in general, Navi was just a lot better, I thought. Like, people are going to look at the scores and be like, oh, it was close on some of the games. Like, you know, what if they'd won map one? You know, what would have happened if they'd won the Inferno game? A lot of that, though, was purely... They they, they lost only... I, okay, here's the best way to say it. They didn't even win those maps. But the only reason they were close was Shocks was in ridiculous form. Like, I remember on Inferno, there was that round he won where he had, like, three health in a 1v1 and that had been a 1v3 before, and he had a pistol and had to headshot the guy. Otherwise, it was an instant loss. Because if one bullet enters his body, he dies there. So if you lose games in which you're winning those sorts of rounds... <coughs> The team in general is not playing very well. That's supposed to be the rounds that are the, the deciders, you know, that put you over the top. Mm. 
Um, anything you can think of that can be done to to help them out? You know, enter analyst stroke coaching mode. Uh, what would you do? I mean, you know, they've tried everything. They've even dyed Chucks' his hair. You know, they've tried him as a blonde. They've tried him au naturel. You know, they're, they're, they're running out of options, surely. I mean, I actually thought that I'd have to look up the exact who made what bands and what picks. But when I when I looked at the maps that were played in that final, I actually thought Envious was like a bit disrespectful. Like, I wonder if them beating Na'Vi earlier on in the tournament made them think like, okay, Na'Vi's a team that we match up well with. Like, you know, we'll beat them on maps that they like. Because if you think about what was played, Cobblestone was the first map. Dust 2 was the second one. Okay, so Navi doesn't like Dust 2. Fair enough. Envious loves Dust 2. Okay, there. But Cobblestone, Dust 2. In the past, Envious was good on Dust 2. Uh, Cobblestone, rather. Then it was Overpass Inferno. Now, if you had to pick out the maps that Navi want to play, aside from Dust 2, they want to play those other three maps. So in a best of five, you've given them the best possible chance to go three to one, which is what they did, basically. So... That in itself is a worry. Like maybe Envious still think of themselves as like, well, we're still like a top two team and, you know, like all these other teams are below us and we can kind of, it's up to us what we want to do and what maps we want to play. I think maybe they could be a bit smarter in terms of the, the pick ban. The problem I see for Envious is that I just think the talent level they have in their team mean they'll never drop below a certain point. Like I'd be very shocked if they're ever outside of like the top five. Like worst for them should probably be like fifth in the world. So that's still pretty good. The problem is do they have any factors that's going to make them like top two or top three again in terms of like being able to make finals and win events? I don't really know because at the moment I think of a lot of other teams and a lot like Navi's super hot form at the moment. Everyone's clicking. Fnatic is still very well rounded. TSM's obviously unbelievably hot form. VP we haven't seen for a while, but they look very good at the last Gfinity. All these other teams have like a few factors which which Envy don't have. So at the moment I think I expect them unfortunately to be kind of stuck in a hell of maybe being like the third, fourth, fifth best team. Yeah, it's interesting. How much do you read into some of the earlier results uh, that happened in the tournament? Uh, you know, losing to G Play, who uh, we'll talk about very briefly yeah. in a, a, a little while. And um, who else did they lose to? It was uh, Flipside, of course, the yeah. Ukrainians. So th these are, you know, they were both 16 14 defeats. But we've talked about this on the show before. Sometimes you look at the 16-14s uh, defeats as almost, you know, that that they're they're indicative of bigger problems than just being outplayed, outclassed. You know, to be that close and yet ultimately to lose, uh, to be in the game but actually not get the result. Uh, do, do, do we need to start panicking? If are Envious going to be this mortal moving forward? I don't know that those results will be like the indicators because. I mean, they have been upset in groups before, and they usually survive past it. And it's not that, the, the problem is that cavalier attitude they have means that I don't think they usually care if they lose a game as long as they get out of the group. You know, that's why they can give up upsets sometimes. In terms of those specific games, the problem with the G play one is first of all, G play played like way better than you could ever expect, and it was still sixteen yeah. fourteen. Like one guy on their team, I remember one. I think in that game that they won, one guy had like eleven kills. So like some other guy had like I think two of them had like twenty eight and twenty five, and were just hard carrying them. Also, no one's played G Play offline. Like, I actually heard going back to the Face It tournament, actually, when I was talking to the Immunity guys, they said that when they'd been there a couple of days earlier, they'd played G Play online and they'd be like, who the fuck are these guys? And that actually, apparently, everyone in Europe's like, this G Play team rolls everyone in online practices. Like, you either beat them completely or they wreck you like 28 to 2 and you're like this is pointless practice you know like who are these guys are they onlineers are they cheaters mm. so i think a lot of people were wondering like are they just going to completely bomb the land and obviously they they didn't do well but they did they surprised a few people so i think just the fact that you've never played them online could be it could be an issue there the flip side one i can't really blame envious because another factor about this tournament is simple is in god mode right now like that guy's level is just unreal at the moment so if you play a team like that, one guy can beat you sometimes. Mm. Um, well, let's let's talk about G Play. As I said, just briefly, the player that did have uh, the, the sort of a breakout tournament, if you like, was Dreamer uh, with a three instead of uh, the second E. Um, he was the one that uh, you know pretty much hard carried, if you like, against Envious. But one of the reasons why they get so much flack online is, in particular, there's a player called Victor. Um, with yep. uh, a one and a seven, uh, a lot of people jokingly refer to him as Vactor uh, in in the scene uh, because the things he does in practices, which you've alluded to, are absolutely unbelievable. 
Um, now, he didn't have a particularly great tournament, but I think rather than dwell on that, this is obviously a very good moment um, for, for Bulgarian Counter-Strike. I mean, obviously not a region we readily associate with uh, esports as a whole, but actually they've had solid Counter-Strike teams in that region that are obviously deprived of opportunity, you know, no sponsors, no infrastructure, etc., for quite some time. I mean, everyone remembers, uh, I think it was Headshot Bombers, I think, were uh, the other sort of team from that region that would be good for an upset. But they only ever attended minor tournaments for the most part, or tournaments where people paid for them. Uh, what do you make of G-Play overall? Do you think this is, you know, with more and more organizations coming in a Counter-Strike and more and more people being forced to pick up wild card teams, could this be an option for somebody out there? I mean, the upsets were interesting. It made me think, like, what's more for this team? It wasn't so great that when they then played Envious in, like, the semis or whatever it was, that they just got completely battered. <laughs> that wasn't that wasn't very exciting. That kind of made it seem like, okay, that killed the hype a bit. And also, unfortunately, as you've singled out here, the Victor guy was the guy that messed it up for them, if, if anything. Because here's the thing. If the team themselves had done well, as a bunch of them did, and he'd done well as well, then it'd be like, right, we're what, what we've got here, guys, is we've just got a star player we didn't know about. Maybe he hadn't been to any big lands and he's going to be the next good player. But the problem with Victor is he's one of the people where the reason people mock him is because when HLTV.org made their stats system and they allowed you to like narrow down by like year and online and offline, online he's something like the 15th best player of the year. And yet at this LAN, he wasn't even close to the best in his team. In fact, he actually let, was a letdown in almost every single map they played. So... He did look like a super onliner, unfortunately, whereas actually some of the others that I didn't have any expectations for, like you mentioned Dreamer here, was actually look reasonably pretty good. I'd like to see him at another land, whereas unfortunately that's not a good sign. If the guy that should be your super good player online, if the team does well offline, you're supposed to then kind of, it's supposed to be your breakout as well. You know, you're supposed to be like, no, yeah. I'm a legit player. You know, like take take note, I'm actually like, it wasn't just online. And so he unfortunately does seem like a bit of an onliner at the moment. Yeah, no doubt about it. Uh, and let's talk about uh, flip side, and then we will leave Star Series far behind in the distance. Uh, you're absolutely on point. Uh, I saw your tweets, uh, which, as always, were debated by the Counter Strike community at length. Uh, the the tweets basically saying simple as a top five player uh, in terms yep. of his current form. I think some people see that as quite a bold claim, but actually, if you just analytically look at the players individually, not what teams they play in, not who they are, and you look at their current form, if he isn't top five, he ain't far off. Uh, it's quite it's just that simple. I mean, who would you say? You know, you, I, I would struggle to put five players ahead yeah, it's of him hard. in godlike form. You know, he's, the problem is, if you pick out other players, like say we, say we did our top five now, mm. once you get past the couple of obvious first ones, yeah. you'd start picking players where they also maybe even play in the same team as some of the other names we're mentioning, some of the other really sick players. So here's the thing. People used to say this when Kenny S was in his God mode, okay? Titan was obviously not close to like a top four team, but he was in God mode. So there used to be this weird anti-circle jerk against him that said, oh, he only looks that good because his team sets him up to look that good. And you know what? He also only looks that good because he's in a bad team. And I just said to people, people in real life, like experts who would say that to me, I'd say, okay, uh, show me another example when that ever happened in history. Like, show me a player playing not for a top team who against every team, including better teams, always dominates and is the best player in the server. I can't yeah. think of one. It just doesn't happen. The whole point is, it's actually harder when you're in a terrible team to have a chance. If you go up against a team like an Envious or a Na'Vi, you're, not, you're, you're supposed to have like decent, you're supposed to be like a Nitro. You have like your 15 kills and you're like, listen, I did all right, but you're not supposed to look like the best player in the server. You're on the worst team. Simple can look like the best player on the server against practically almost anyone. Yeah. Like, I mean, he had this, someone brought it up the other day. He had this crazy online series against Na'Vi a few months back, just before CCS, where he had like a plus 50 over four maps or something, which is like, that's Na'Vi we're talking about here. It's not, not just some bad team, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, look, let's, uh, let's do the statistical analysis. HLTV.org compiled uh, stats at the end of the event uh, for Star Series. This is just obviously the group stage. Let's talk about the group stage that he had. And keep in mind the way the format worked, if you, for those that didn't follow the tournament, obviously the group stage was everyone was in a group uh, with each other playing best of ones. So in the group stage, Simple had the highest kill-death ratio with plus 55. The next one was Dreamer with plus 28. So, you know, double 
the, the, the closest person. He had the highest kills and assists per round at 1.06. Uh, 57% of his rounds had at least a kill from him, uh, again, making him the highest. Uh, what else? There's just He's the top of everything. Um, come on, what else have we got? Uh, there's some stats I don't even know what this. Well, what the fuck is a domination meter? I don't even know what that is, but uh, okay. Uh, highest amounts of uh, rounds won. Highest amount of AWP kills per round with 0 0.6, which was ahead of Guardian. So, yeah, just apps and, and the highest total amount of AWP kills as well. And the highest number of entry kills. So, yeah. I mean, w w this guy is literally doing it all. You know, he, he's, he's fragging consistently. But not only is he getting multiple kills, he's getting important kills. He's getting entry kills. He's orping. He's rifling. This kid is the... He wins the tackle. clutch rounds. He does yeah, everything. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it's sorry as well, yeah. The, the number of clutch rounds won. Five. Again, highest of anyone in the group stage. So, like, I've actually got a piece coming up that I've, I'm writing about him. It's not super long. It's just it's going to be on these topics. Like, one of the things that's crazy about him is... He, he, it's almost like a movie character because we've just described all these incredible, like he's in, in every category, he's the best at the moment, basically, at, at that tournament at least. Obviously that tournament didn't have the Fnatic, TSM, VP, et cetera. A lot of the players we might have put in the category with him. In some ways he was the best player at this tournament, even though his team had no chance of making the final. But, so what's holding him back then? He also has by far the worst reputation and apparently personality. He has basically everything that's not to do with playing the game everything is going against him. So it's like, it's yeah. almost like some Shakespearean character at this point in time. Like it, that's the balance right there, right? That's why he's in the position he's in. Yeah. It's like, uh, it's like the old saying, isn't it? You know, like being simple is his crime, but being simple is also his punishment. You know, he's doomed to be this amazing player that for, you know, outside of flip side, apparently not a lot of people want to play with him. He's got bands that are going to hamper his career. Uh, and that's before you even get into some of the questionable behavior. You know, he's isolated the German market quite uh, uniquely by declaring Germans to be Nazis, uh, which was, you know, not probably not the smartest thing he's ever done, uh, especially in esports, where, you know, I, I don't know if you've heard of this company called ESL, the people that might be wanting to think about rescinding your ban. Turns out the headquarters are in Germany, mate. So, uh, you know. Not that ESL would get upset about that. I've always found them to be quite magnanimous in that sense. Well, but, maybe um, from my maybe from my incident, he mistakenly assumed they were all Polish, so he he thought it was it was fair game. He thought no one would notice if he said anything about Germany, you know. So maybe but, we'll, what we'll do is we'll do a reverse trade. I'll go to all the German events for ESL, and he can just go to Katowice <laughs> every year, and we'll 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 figure it out like that. Simple. Call me. Yeah, yeah, call me. Let's work it out. But seriously, you know, it is it is a frustrating uh, presence, really, in, in the scene that a player who should be in a top team, should be winning events, it, you know, is certainly good enough to even elevate an, a mediocre team to, to put them in the mix uh, where, where they could be challenging and certainly getting placements that are going to yield prize money. And yet he can't. He simply cannot no team can touch him. He is that much of a toxic asset. Is there any way it can be fixed at this point? Because, you know, even if he curbs his behavior, the ESL ban is absolutely critical. You know, they're, they're, they're saying it's not going to get lifted to 2016. Um, I mean, there's, I don't even know if there's an, an option to extend it or whatever, uh, whether ESL might decide to do that based on some of the other stuff. But um, it, can this be fixed? Can this be resolved for him? Uh, it seems like no. Like, there's two factors to it. One is that it is quite depressing. Like, I've actually said this before. I don't, when I say it's depressing, that doesn't mean like I'm in favor of saying Germans are Nazis. What's depressing is the idea that a player, just in isolation of his talent, is playing at this God mode level, but almost like the Kenny Essie he's not in a position to have any real chance to win because he, he's not on a good enough team. And the problem with that sort of a scenario, which is the second factor, is that. 
it just never lasts that long. You can never be in that sort of a God mode for usually more than even a few months at a time. I mean, to think about it, like there's a famous saying in the NBA, right, where they used to say like a, a really good player can have one game where he goes crazy and he has 50 points and you're like, wow, what a great player. The difference is like the God-like players like Michael Jordan or Larry Bird, they used to have like three weeks where they did that. And they just, every team they played, they would just do that in a row, you know. But even then, it's not like they did it for the entire season, you know. They have off times and they have seasons that are just good but not the best ever. The problem is I can't see how Simple can, can stay at this form till the ban ends. That's the problem. Yeah. If he did, I think it would solve a lot of his problems. Like if you play this well, eventually one of those teams, a Navi, a Hellraiser, is going to be like, come on, we're not winning events. I mean, Navi is now, but you know what I mean? If we need to do something, this is the obvious option. It's like this is, we've got a nuke here that we can add into our arsenal. The problem is I can't see how he can survive till next year at this level of form. If he does, then he's going to be one of the best players ever, period. So... I guess there's an upside for you if you want a bright side, but it's unlikely to happen. So unfortunately, if he has all these big problems and then he, he cools off, yeah, why is someone going to take a chance on him? Why is someone going to overlook all the, the massive personal problems that he has? I can't see how how he can solve the equation, as it were. I mean, the the obvious option for him, I suppose, uh, would be, uh, you know, to, to maybe transition into a team like Na'Vi or one of the better... Uh, CIS teams in that region if he had the option to because his future surely cannot lie with his current flip side uh, roster if as you say he can maintain that form his ban is going to end like you say in six months that is a long time in Counter-Strike terms and uh, anything can happen between them I mean the game's probably is going to get patched two or three times who knows what Valve are going to do um, you know he could he could find himself completely shit out of luck uh, you know like like some Orpers certainly did. So I, I don't know. I, I think it's a real tough one. And, and I think you're quite right in your observation that no team, e even now, if they could have him, if the ban wasn't there, I think there would still be teams that would be loath to touch him. You add everything together as a complete package and it's almost like the form doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter how good he is. I, I still can't believe that he actually was stupid enough to get caught. Uh, basically, ban evading by playing on another another account, especially given ESL's history of like they they tend to unban people who show contrition and enter that rehabilitation yeah. and, and that kind of thing. It just seems like so ridiculous. The problem is, he is a sixteen year old kid from Russia who, well, Ukraine, but who probably doesn't know much of it. Like, he, I bet he probably didn't know anything about that. So that doesn't excuse it, but. It's also not quite the same as someone who's like a 22-year-old American who's played ESEA for 10 years. You know, like there's a different scenario there. So, in fact, actually, funny enough, if I'm trying to theory craft, the only team I can think of who, if I were them, I'd, I'd try to pick him up now. Because remember, all you're going to get from having Simple right now is you can't play the ma next major, probably the next two. Uh, oh, no, you can play the DreamHack one, obviously. So you can't play the ESL Cologne. Yeah. You mainly want him because he's just going to go ham and make, help you with online games and the odd upset offline, and you're going to get a lot of exposure. So the obvious mix to me is why doesn't Kingwin get him? That would be that would be the thing I can think of because they've got the money where they can maybe pay him to do that. But then again, I, I think who Kingwin have the money to pay guy? ESL a look the other way. Like they could just give also, simple yeah. a fake mustache and just be like, you know, I'm 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 not him. I'm his brother, which of course was the guy who was cheating on his account, obviously. Yeah, um, no, that, I can't think of anyone else who's going to do it now. Yeah, um, we'll we'll move on. I, I you know we'll uh, we'll talk about some of the other news. Uh, there's obviously lots uh, going on this week, uh, but uh, we will try and get through it all. So while we just brought up King Win, the the team, I I like to bash him a little bit. Actually, I'm going to admit that I'm going to go on the record and say, as much as I love, you know, Makalela and and Rain, you know. Scream as well, yeah, just kind of the collective. I do like bashing them, so there it is. Full disclosure: I, do, I don't like an organization kind of owning this bigger piece of esports. Makes me very uncomfortable. So yeah, f fuck them. But anyway, they've uh, lost. Cheers for uh, queering that Kingwin deal that we might have gotten for you know the sponsor <laughs> sponsorship and all that, Rich. But okay, no, hey, yeah. you don't have to. You don't have to come on board with me, mate. You can stay okay. on the. You can distance yourself from my comments if you okay, want. Okay, Kingwin, if you if you wanna if you wanna get sponsorship, you can have your logo on my side of the screen here. Just like pay me. <laughs> Stop saying pay me. But anyway, there you go. Hey, I, I, I'm not about the money, brother. You know that's why I'm on this show. Um, so, Kingwin lose Huitten, 
Uh, that cannot be how it's pronounced. It is so fucking... That is ridiculous. Anyway, is, they lose him. They lose him uh, for the Gaming Paradise qualifier due to medical reasons, which haven't been disclosed, like at least when um, Bondic had Quincy. They were very specific about it, Flipside, very specific about what he had and what the prognosis was. And um, in this instance, it's... Uh, Medical reasons. Now, I don't think it's any um, se secret that he's the, one of the weaker players. But uh, they've said apparently he was rushed to hospital after he started coughing up blood. Rain has got a foot infection. I, <laughs> okay. that, it's just the way you, I, don't, I don't think you even noticed it, but the way you said that there, it's no secret that he's one of the weaker players. And you were like, he was rushed to hospital. There's always like <laughs> yeah, so yeah, shit so at CS. Yeah. And yeah. they were like, this guy's fucking terrible. Get him. <laughs> well, no, nurse, get is, me in here. The, 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 the point is, yeah, yeah. We need gets, an injection of skill. This guy, he's, not, he's gonna die, he's gonna pass on. He's had too many negative start lines. <laughs> you can't, but the thing is, actually, if that happened, I think the doctor would call it. I think he would just fucking hold his okay. wrist all yeah. the time of death because, you know, I don't think he's gonna contribute much to Kingwin. Where I was going with the line of questioning is, okay, first of all, it seems really bizarre that they've all contracted leprosy in the same week or something. But uh, is there any chance that this is like a precursor to Whitten dropping out of the team? Because ultimately, you know, King Win, they, they, they did have the option, I believe, to maybe attend this Gfinity. I, I'm pretty sure they were contacted uh, to fill that last space. Um, obviously, with all these health problems, uh, which, you know, I'll take it at face value. Um, they didn't go. But, uh, you know, is this an opportunity to use a stand-in? Is that an opportunity to maybe transition him out of the team? That is the suspicious part, is that, again, you shouldn't be getting a stand-in. This is like when Elevate uh, brought the, brought in Hiko and Skadoodle for that, uh, I think it was a Sivo land or something like that, like a land that they brought them in. That's like, they should really, it's a bit suspicious when the stand-in is better than the player he's replacing. Like, that shouldn't really be happening, should it? Like, usually a stand-in supposed be worse than you because you have to so again they've brought in nico who himself is one of like the great online players in cs is an amazing online form and a lot yeah. of people would like to see in a team like king win in fact that's exactly the sort of team where you'd want to put him in because fans have always wondered what would happen if he got proper team and lands and all that stuff so that is a bit suspicious i guess i don't doubt that he could be ill i my joke is obviously that I kind of hope he does get removed from the team and the scene just because I don't want to have to keep saying that name in 17 different variations <laughs> hoping I get it right once. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I don't know, man. Well, I at think least they probably, if they could have attended that event, though, they should have. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. But, of course, we know it actually wouldn't make sense for them uh, because it, it's like, I know we talked about this privately, you know, it would be a real hype killer. If uh, Kingwin went to a second tournament so soon after a disappointing dream hack, they get spanked by everyone there who's better prepared. Obviously, you know, if these health issues are a factor, they've got players that aren't playing at 100%, and they get wrecked, and all of a sudden this hype train about Kingwin, who, lest we forget, I'm, I'm now reliably informed, have surpassed even TSM in terms of salary. All of a sudden that hype train gets a little bit derailed, Kingwin starting to think, Hang on a minute, what did we do? You know, would we have been better off burning that money? Like all the rest that we've burnt. And the players start panicking. The fans are like, yeah, this isn't worth it. I'll go back to supporting Nip. You know, it, it, it would have been a bit of a crippler for them, I think. Yeah, I mean, that is the issue is I can't see how they possibly would have had any chance at the tournament. The tournament's like reasonably stacked. So it would have been worse than DreamHack, if anything, for them. So they wouldn't have done well. With that said, though, I mean, how long can they really get away with like not being good if that is if that is indeed the problem? Rich, they have to attend some lands eventually and lose. Yeah. They can't just like, oh yes, and this other guy ha has been committed to a mental asylum, but only for the week of the land. <laughs> Make it sound like the be fucking eighty. <laughs> you know like that, I mean? Yeah, yeah we just have to break him out. Um, but I, I, I'd like that. I think that would endear them a bit more to me if they actually broke a player out of a of an asylum to go and basically play Counter-Strike. I think I think it would be a huge improvement and welcome in the scene in general. It's um, Makaleli. It's just locked in a cell like, the chair, it does, how does it go? The chair's too tall. How? It, and I am supposed to kneel? Like, there's a lever, mate. You just that, I was that thinking lever. that as well. Like, it, what, a, what a perfect <laughs> opportunity it would have been for him to get sponsored by Need for Seat. Like, 
They make a custom one with a giant lever for him, like, you know, with, like, pull here written on the side. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, uh, so another bit of news, another uh, some more roster jiggery-pokery going on was uh, Nihilum, obviously, in N.A., uh, another word that we, we don't like pronouncing. Um, or I don't. I don't know about you. Uh, they uh, have cut ties with uh, the player Automatic, um, you know, obviously been with the team for quite some time, six months. Um, so what do we make of this? Because we've been talking Nihilum up on this show, talking about that X factor of Semphis and Hiko. They've had a great deep run in ESL, ESEA league, uh, where they've actually really brought themselves into contention. And then this last week, they've had an absolute slump of epic proportions. They dropped down to sixth. Um, all of which, of course, has happened while they've got uh, Ligia uh, as a coach. So significant investment being made in the team. What do you make of this? Like, do you know? Did they need to change something, or did they need to just accept slumps in form happen? Yeah, the problem was it was so epic. Like up until that point. I thought they were doing really well. Like I said, they always used to have all these close games, but they always used to find a way to win through them. And it seemed like they had like a, they had like a level of quality to them. You know, they had some sort of consistency. And I was thinking in the last week, okay, if it's going to be between them and CLG and Liquid, well, I'm putting my mind on Neilam. You know, I think they're the ones that are going to come through. Liquid are on a slump down. CLG maybe seen better days, but obviously instead Neilam's the one that completely blew it. And then removing this player. I'm not that sure because my main issue is who, who are they going to get to be like the full-time replacement? Because if it's, listen, if it's going to be some power move, if that's the idea, then okay, do an upgrade. That Maybe that's something you think can help. But I, I didn't think he was the worst player in the team. So I'm wondering what the real reason to remove him is. There's been there's been talks about it being uh, Desi, I think. I, I can know. see that. I can understand that. I mean, obviously these two, uh, Hiko played with Desi briefly when he was in Elevate. Actually, was he in Elevate at the time? I think he was. Um, I think Desi's a good player. He's an aggressive player. I think that would be an upgrade. Mm. So maybe that does make sense if that's the move. I mean, it's obviously... Quite, it's, it's quite interesting, actually, because apparently uh, Desi had been seen... Uh, I think he was sc scrimming or was certainly on the team speak or whatever uh, comms program they use of uh, Luminosity, I believe. Um, okay. uh, so... He, he's around. Like, I think he wants to get back into the game. But there's this perception about him, which is coming out from a lot of NA players, that apparently like his attitude is the worst. Like He is Sir Buzz Killington when it comes to being in a team with him. Now, I've had a number of players say this to me, and they've been like, look, when you, when you play with him, he gets super frustrated. He blames his teammates if a round doesn't go well, shouts, screams, throws his headset. You know, like, this is just online <laughs> this is like online during practices you know so i don't know if that's maybe been a little bit of a hindrance to him getting into a better team but apparently he is a rage monster in a lot of in a lot of ways now i i think as things stand one of the things that i admire most about hiko is he doesn't care about any of the, the bullshit or the baggage he just wants to do things his way and he wants to create the best team he can to win on on his own terms. So that might be enough to to maybe bring Desi in as as a fifth. But of course, again, these are all rumors and speculation, which I absolutely uh, need to qualify. Um, just uh, any any thoughts then? I mean, you know, you've already said Desi would be a, a step up if Desi doesn't get into this team. You know, he needs to be in one soon, right? I mean, he's really missing the boat at the moment. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. I always thought, I wondered why the other teams hadn't picked him up yet, hadn't considered him yet. So I was wondering, maybe this is something to do with it. Like, they, they prefer people that they get on with better. The problem is, I think in a way it can be a good thing. Like, I, like from just talking to him myself, I would describe, I've used this term before in League of Legends, where it's like a guy who's called an irrational confidence guy. It's an NBA term. Yeah. And they mean the guy who, like, thinks he's better than he is. But that can help sometimes, because as a result, he's kind of like the guy who, who isn't intimidated by the star player who actually is better than he is. And he can play his game against him. So that could be a good thing. NA needs some players out who are willing to, to, to think that they can at least play against European players. And, and if they have some skills like Desi does, yeah, that, that can help. The problem being, like, yeah, 
if it's if it's having a negative effect on teammates, I can see there's certain, especially supportive players, and the less skilled ones, who you're just going to make them play even worse. So it won't make up for you playing better. Now, yeah. maybe in that sense, Neilam's the right team because first of all, in terms of personality, I don't think Hiko's going to stand for any shit like that. He's like the alpha male of the team, you know. Where if anything, he's the guy who thinks he's the best. So you're gonna have to you're gonna have to play exceptionally if you want to even be able to talk shit to Hiko. So there's that. Semphis has been around the scene a long time. I don't think he, he doesn't really give a fuck about how good someone's aim is. He just cares about how well they play the game. So you also can't really fuck with him in a sense. Mm. So maybe they're the guys who could corral someone like Desi in that sense. And, and also I've noticed those sorts of players, if they are a bit arrogant, the one of the ways you can fix them is put them with someone who's better than them. And then at least they'll look up to that guy. You know, like they won't, in theory, unless they're crazy, they won't be like talking trash to that guy if he's actually a better player than they are. Because if their metric yeah. is how good you are and what you get away with, then then he has authority over them, you know. Okay. Uh, obviously. But in Elevate, people... I don't think they had anyone like that. So I could maybe see how that could have gotten out of control. Yeah. Obviously, the big news, which happened, uh, I think it was the day after we did our last show, was uh, Vox Eminor. Uh, we did talk about it briefly. I think both of us knew uh, what was going to happen. Uh, and that was, of course, they went to our mutual associate, uh, Monte Cristo's new venture called Renegades. Uh, we, we speculated last week about, you know, if they if they went salaried and they went full time, what they'd be able to realistically achieve. I think I was a bit more complimentary than yourself. Uh, let's just sort of talk about this briefly. Obviously, it's huge news, but uh, a week later, it's been kind of done to death. What's your opinions about it? Well... The thing that's really exciting about this, beyond the team itself, to me, is the idea that that's an NA organization. So if the idea is to bring them to NA, well, immediately, like, that makes NA a lot more exciting. I, or NA already got this cool little injection from Keed Stars turning up and playing in the region. So now you had all the NA teams and Keed Stars. If you're Vox as well, suddenly, first of all, there's none of those crying about we have no one to play with. Now you'll have four or five, six different teams you could all practice. That, that should help in itself. And you have some outside influence. Now, in terms of Vox as a team, that should help them in itself. They'll have more teams around their level they can play. And I also think the underrated factor about Vox, which is why I think they're a smart pickup, is that, yeah, they come from Australia where there aren't many good players, but crucially, they speak English as the first language. So if you, they speak English and you're in NA, well, if you want to play a, replace a player, just get an NA player. You don't even have to get another Australian necessarily. So I think there's a lot of upside to this. I think it's a smart gamble. It is a gamble. We don't know. How it, it's very. It's not certain at all it will work out and there'll be a top eight team. But I think it's a good gamble in terms of who, who was available and and maybe however cheap you can get them at this point in time. You know, before the next inflationary bubble comes along. Yeah, true. Um, I mean, realistically though, do you think they've got that? potential to get to a level we haven't already seen them at because you know i'm excited at the prospect of seeing what they're going to do if they're already capable of taking maps off the likes of Fnatic, the likes of nip uh we, we've seen them do this you know at uh, gfinity is is there an opportunity that you know it, it doesn't just become maps it becomes series and actually these guys become some sort of crazy wild card that's gonna you know turn that top 10 on its head a little bit well, the good thing is we'll definitely get to find out. Like, well, mm -hmm. in a year from now, in three, we should have no way that we have this. This shouldn't be a question anymore. We'll either know that they weren't good enough or we'll know that it was there, there were some potential. So to me, the big question right now is if indeed the plan from being an NA org is, because presumably the plan can't be to keep them in Australia because that seems like a waste of time. You know, you're either going to bring them to Europe or NA. If they bring them to NA, then I think you've already got an immediately interesting question there of can they become the best NA team? I mean, this is a region that, I mean, I mean regionally there, obviously, because this is the team, like I'd say, Cloud9's there, Keed Stars is there. I mean, previously, like Neelam, et cetera, we would have put them in the same mix. There's a bunch of good teams there. So just getting to the top of that ladder would would, in, would prep them, I think, to maybe be a team that can make like a top eight run at a big tournament. The problem is, at the moment, unless something drastic happens, I don't ever see them becoming like a top six team in the world. So there's still a lot of work to be done before they can. But the, the thing is, the, the few spots above where they are, are up for grabs in the next few months. So it's, it's, an, it's an opportunity, certainly. You're friends with Monty. You know, you hang out. Yeah, you know, drink together, all of that all stuff. Right. Chinking glasses with the League of Legends money. I don't get okay. I don't get invited to these parties. So okay. come on, d dish the dirt. What does Monty see in this? Uh, these Australians? Well, that's the thing. Because he doesn't know anything about CSGO, 
he would ask like, oh, what, like what teams are available? Like what's like kind of the temperature of the scene? And unfortunately I told him like, with, with just unfortunately the exponential growth of CS, most of the good teams have actually been signed up fairly recently. Like mm. the last three to nine months is when almost everyone's contract was signed. So either you're going to have to wait a while, like wait three or four months, maybe six months and pay top dollar and just be certain that the team that you're paying top dollar for is going to be good, which is doable. You can do it if you want to spend a lot of money or you're going to have to gamble on someone else. And if you're going to gamble on someone else, it's going to be these sorts of lineups that are like a flip side, a Dignitas, Vox, Hellraisers, these level of teams. And I said they are gambles. Like all of those teams, all of them have certain upsides that they could maybe be like the eighth best team in the world, but all of them also could fuck up and be the 13th best team. So it is a big gamble. It's like I said, I think what was alluring was the fact, as I mentioned, kind of the circumstantial aspects of like this team hasn't had proper practice. Therefore, that's a, a positive that some of those other teams I mentioned already have the practice. You can replace some of the players maybe one day if you need to with North American players that are very good. So I think it's a good, like, it's like a fixer upper. Like, I think you could do a lot with this team going forward. So I think that's, I think he's at like of a similar mind. I didn't, I didn't like convince him to do it. I just gave him this advice and then he made his own decision. So I think he's on, on a similar page though. Yeah. Uh, okay. Let's uh, talk about uh, another uh, interesting uh, move uh, that, that's happened this week, uh, qu quite recently, actually. Um, NIP decided that uh they have if actually no I'll leave, I'll leave nip we'll come we'll come back to that one let's talk about hunden uh being dropped in sk gaming first now i yeah. did theorize we talked about this didn't we when sk gaming got picked up we both agreed that what was probably going to happen was that they, that current five players they were a placeholder ultimately and that if anyone started underperforming the sk gaming management notoriously ruthless we're just going to come in and chop them and start replacing them with names that at least have star power, you know, if not uh, ability. And Hunden, perhaps unsurprisingly, uh, it was the first one out the door. He's been cut from the team after, uh, you know, a, p a poor level of performance. Uh, in the statement, it was described as a tough decision to switch him out, but the right thing to do to improve the lineup. So uh, he's obviously the in-game leader as well, and they bring in uh, another uh, uh, in-game leader in the form of Berry, who used to play for a Nexus uh, in 1.6, I think. And he, you know, he was around... Yeah, that was, that was at a time when the Danish scene were very, very strong. Obviously had the MTW you know, players at the time, and you know, he was basically in sort of the, the secondary Danish team's you know, behind yeah. them. So what do you make of this? Is this the first of many changes to come or is he the final piece uh, of the jigsaw puzzle for SK Gaming? Yeah, it's hard to tell because like you say, it's it's mainly going to be alluding back to the history he had in 1.6. And the thing is, in 1.6, he wasn't like anything close to a star player. He was just like a decent player. Yeah. And among those teams, he was like one of the guys who made up the numbers. He wasn't the worst by any means, but he was just a decent player. It's, it, most famously, I remember they had one event that was like a breakout, which was actually at the beginning of 2010 at the IEM uh, 4 European Championship, which is the one that Mouse Sports won when they just got Roman. They actually shocked everyone in this group stage, this best of one group stage, in the team called Roskilde Ravens. And they had Fries, who's in this team with him now, which I presume is his entry point to this team, was on the same team. And they actually shocked this group stage and came out in like second place or something, or tied for first or something crazy where they beat a bunch of teams. Like I think they beat SK or they beat Mouse Sports, a, bu a bunch of top level teams. And so beyond that they didn't do that great like they got absolutely smashed by Fnatic I remember and then beyond that they were just kind of stuck in that position of like they were the, either the second or the third best Danish team and that usually if you did well was good enough for maybe like a fifth to eighth at an event yeah. but you were never going to win a big event you were never probably even going to make a top four because top fours are very hard to come by in CS 1.6 because the game was kind of like uh, you could be quite consistent if you're a top team so I don't think it's going to be an inclusion like this is some star inclusion that will boost that aspect of the team Maybe in terms of in-game leadership, it can do something. We saw how MSL's addition to Dignitas kind of turned that team around. He wasn't known as a star player or anything, but just as an in-game leader, he's managed to put the pieces in the right place. So with the history with Freeze, maybe that... I, I have to figure it's an upgrade, put it out because I didn't, I didn't think very highly of Hunden. I thought he wasn't a very good player. And he well, didn't that seem was like the other that, thing that I was going to bring up, actually. Leader. 
remember when we were talking about it and I, I was saying, yeah. yeah, you know, there'll probably be some changes coming. And you went, you do know that that Hunden is shit, right? He's a I mean, really he bad player. He's just a bad player, yeah. He's one of the worst of any pro player. So there's nothing more can be said about that. Like, but I, since I haven't seen Berry, it's not like I would, I would say that. One of the it, worst, though. Come on. There's got to be worse, worse than Hunden. Okay. Yeah, I, I'll be, the thing is, we probably don't <laughs> yeah. know them, though. Yeah, exactly. Because they're, they're bad. Okay, he's the he's the most famous shit player in the world. Rich, there you go. You you got Thank your you. statement out of me. There Thank you. you. Thank you. No, no, I just wanted you to say something positive, mate. That's all it okay. was. Yeah. Well, that, that is sort of positive in a way. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I, I, agree. I agree. I'm sure if he watches okay. the VOD, he'll have a little. Trouble okay. Himself. Here's the joke for you, Rich. Someone did a, a picture the other day, which was a picture of uh, Kanye West and Kim Kardashian, and then Beyonce and Jay Z, and they were at an awards show, and it yeah. said like. It said like uh, Beyonce, 17 Grammy Awards, you know, Jay-Z, 18 Grammy Awards, Kanye West, 21 Grammy Awards, Kim Kardashian, sex tape. And that's like, you, you could do a, an image like that for any of Hunden's teams. Like you could do all like how good players they are, things they've done and then just say like fifth man on like him or something, you know. It's a shame. I, like a lot, a lot changed for him, you know, like he was... He was in the scene and, and was, was a decent player, played in a lot of good uh, Danish source teams. Then, you know, got old, had a kid, wasn't able to put as much time in. You know how the game's like that. You've got you to be all about the game. It's like the streets, yeah? You've got to be yeah. grinding on them corners, mate. Yeah, well, no, in his but... case, I, if I'd, I'd just like give it up and become a janitor because you're going to get wrecked in that next drug drive by. You know, like you're not going, you, you you can't you can't roll in the streets. Your your hood pass is revoked. You, no one's <laughs> buying crack from you anymore. Uh, and also, that new young guy with the chains and you know the slick back perm is probably going to beat the crap out of you and take your block from you. You know, so Got step up, don't, don't try and step up to the streets, Hunden. It's over for you, mate. Yeah, the streets are cold. At least he got out the game alive, I suppose. Um, he didn't get caught riding dirty, Rich. <laughs> Whatever that means. I don't even know what that means, really. Yeah, you do. Yeah, you do, mate. I'm starting to piece together a picture <laughs> about you, mate. Using phrases like riding dirty, always wearing basketball <laughs> yeah. tops. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's how I made it in this game. Connections, you know. <laughs> so, now we can talk about NIP. Uh, they brought Exist back as in-game leader. Yay, that'll fix everything. Yeah. Um, so the Get Right era, they did a tournament, didn't win. Exist was actually one of the good things about it. He was freed up and started playing a lot better individually. Unfortunately, once again, same old problem with NIP. One player steps up, all the others, well, not all the others, but at least two others take a step back. So it, they just haven't been able to get all the parts of the machine working as it should. So, exist back to, to Call of Duties. Does this fix NIP's problem, Duncan? I don't know if it fixes it. I think it will probably, ideally, just put them back to where they were before they made the move, which is that like, they were a solid team, and, if, and if, if the star players played well and carried them a bit, then they always had a bit of punch in them when they got into playoffs and they, they could they could get those top fours. Maybe if they went perfectly, they could get a final. But I don't think they're going to ever get back to the level of being number one. And like I said, I don't think they can be number one with this lineup. With that said, I think this whole affair, I would hope this has been a learning experience for the NIP players in how to deal it with public relations. Like, don't ever flip out on the Reddit circle joke. If you're a player and, like, attack people when it can then come back to bite you very quickly. Like, think about what they did, okay? When they made this move to put Get Right in as the in-game leader, obviously, like on shows like this, I mean, at the time, I don't think we had this show, I can't remember if we did, we, people will speculate and they'll be like, is that a good move? That's just like talking points. No one's like condemning you for making the move and no one's seen anything. So we can only go for what we've seen. So at the time, most people in the community were like, why would you put any, a star player as the in-game leader? Why would you put yep. a lurker as the in-game leader? Why, what is Exist going to do? You know, all the obvious questions. So Nip's response, rather than be like, well, we'll just show them with our play that what a great move it is. Instead, they all came out on Twitter and they were like, oh, you know, like, you, you know, you, don't, you guys don't know what you're talking about and, you know, how ignorant, like, oh, look, we actually, I was the in-game leader for the games we just won shows what you know about NIP, you know, like you don't know what's going on inside the team, you know, what we've kind of heard from NIP recently at certain events. So then they have the nice little run online, they go to their first LAN, it doesn't go that well, they lose fairly, they lose to Narvi, they lose convincingly Fnatic, and then they immediately revert the, all the changes 
which makes mm. it so, the scenario where I can now just fuck with them and be like, what's wrong, Nip? You're so ignorant. You don't know about Nip's great calling with the jet, right? Oh, I guess you just don't know what's going on inside. You know, like all the same jokes that they just fucking said as real statements. Like if I were them, I would have just cooled their jets on that a bit. And if it was really a great move, just show it. You've only been to one LAN. And after I mean, one LAN, you is, changed it. Like I'm actually genuinely, and you know, I'm not just saying this to sort of play a bit of devil's advocate to what you're saying, because I agree with what you're saying. But equally, okay. I feel hugely sorry for the players. Uh, and, and you're probably going to be like, how is that? What is this human emotion? You call empathy, okay. Richard. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So while we have our Star Trek moment, right, okay. I'll explain it. So first of all, be, you know, everything's great when you're winning. It's always hard to be uh, a, a dynastic team that is habitually, you know, you're bred on success. And then one day it's just not there. That in itself is a terrible feeling. But that isn't where the sympathy comes from. Because if you're a winner and you're bred on success, you've got to keep winning. That's just the nature of the business. If you don't, somebody else will. So there's that. Then there's the, the amount of relentless pressure. They've got the largest fan bases. And, you know, we've talked about it. Nip fans are an interesting group. They can be not fair weather, but certainly vitriolic. Uh, like because they too as fans have been bred on success so they get a little bit of that sort of Manchester United if you like kind of mindset which is it, it's our right to win and when the players don't win they're not winning for us and I revel in that glory so that if the players don't deliver fuck them we now hate the players that we once loved and it, it turns like that very quickly um, so that must be a horrible feeling the people you're expecting to back you up are actually the most vocal critics. And I think any player that has to go through that, and there's only a handful that ever do, that really see that flip from your own fan base uh, in, in esports, uh, I think that in itself is just a head wreck. You're like, how do I, how, how do I make sense of this? But that isn't even why uh, I have the most sympathy for them. Um, internally, that organization is a mess. There are things going on. Uh, pertaining to the dig life uh, acquisition that have put those players in difficult positions uh, that they certainly don't have the support infrastructure that they at one time did. There's question marks about what Heaton's role in the organization even is anymore. And obviously we can't talk too much about it, but these players are not in a good place in terms of the support network. And the worst part of all, with all of that going on, they're still expected to win, even though I don't think they're necessarily being given the tools for success. And the players know they themselves are failing to deliver. I have never seen players take it so bad. I, I, I probably say this every week, but it's the, it's the worst feeling to have to be, to do my job, to be critical of real human beings, you know, that like, they're all about the game. It's like, it's no, they're a lot like me, perhaps like you in the sense that, we give so much of ourselves over to what we do for a living that actually it does feel like a personal attack when you attack what we do for a living, if you're critical of it. It's very hard to separate the person from the, the position because we ourselves haven't made that separation. So sure. the, the, these guys, you know, the, there was, we're having a beer in the hotel at DreamHack and Patrick's just like, look, mate, you say what you need to say, you know, Forrest, you say what you need to say on, on your show. Like, I am playing bad. Nobody knows that more than me. That's horrible to have that conversation while having a drink with somebody. And, and they've never come out and complained about the stuff that's going on in the organization. The one thing that they can complain about, and it's quite safe, is complain about what we do. The pundits, the critics, the armchair analysts. So I do actually have a lot of sympathy. I think it's an expression of frustration at everything that's going on right now. Sure, but, but my problem with the way it's done is just that essentially they're trying to like have it both ways. Like when they first do these crazy moves, like they change up a position or they change a player or they change in game leader, they always present it as like, okay, this is going to work, like everything's going to go great. And then 
all the, all we're essentially saying when we speculate is like, hmm, this move doesn't make sense, and therefore the fact that it doesn't make sense is it's a desperation move. You know, maybe they know there's problems, maybe they know at the moment that what they currently do won't work. It's like they can't accept that that's the the conditions for doing it, and yet the fact that they have to revert the changes kind of shows that it was kind of like a gamble. It was a get desperation move. They hoped it'd pay off. It didn't. And so now they go back to what at least, you know, like the, the known value of, well, I know this works. This guy did it before. I know roughly what this guy can give me. So their problem is the, the same problem that they don't want to believe exists, which is what we always get back to, which is it's not that Nip wasn't didn't have the right setup before and they weren't playing the right style for them before. They had a pretty much, it was all in place. They just aren't good enough to be the best in the world. And so as long as they themselves think they can be the best in the world, they're in for a hard life and their fans are in for a hard life and the org's in for a hard life. So I, I don't expect players to ever say that they, 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 they give up and they won't make it. But just as, a, as an analyst, to me, it's obvious that none of these are going to fix the problem, which is the true problem, which is they're not going to be the best again. Mm. That's always going to be there. Yeah. Um, so let's, uh, quickly look at, uh, the ESCL, ESEA Pro League finals that have, uh, sort of been, now been completed. The, the main season's done. We've got the finalists. We know who's going to, uh, be going to Cologne. Um, and not really a lot of surprises. It runs on from the NIP discussion, of course, because NIP aren't going to be there. Which I would have said at the start of the season would have been unthinkable, actually. Um, they just think out. of how bad that is. If you want to add up all the other stuff, the one thing yeah. they always had going for them is every major. It's true, they did make the finals of all the majors. That's mm -hmm. great. So eat to, that's why I always understood why the most casual NIP fan didn't get that NIP weren't the best anymore. Because it's like, well, mate, if you watch like the 10 other tournaments that they play, they're not even coming close to winning these tournaments. So yeah, they make them, they, as long as they did the major, it's like you could keep every fan thinking, oh, we are still you know, almost there. We're almost winning everything. The mm -hmm. problem now is, I mean, this isn't a major, I'll probably fight like that, but in terms of every other aspect of procedure and scale and the teams, so it is. Like, it's yeah. at the same level as a major. So the fact that they're not even going to even be there, never mind make the final, is historic. This is the, this is the, the historic team in CSGO, and they're not going to be at the first big one of these tournaments. Yeah, and, you know, it's, it's sort of the nature uh, in which they missed out. You know, they've, they've only missed out by two results. They needed to go on a ridiculous run to leapfrog Envious. Uh, I think there was even a potential that TSM could have dropped out as well, I think. Uh, I think TSM might... had already locked it up. I'm not oh, sure. had they? Yeah, sorry. So, yeah, it was between NIP and Envious. Um, and, and Nip basically needed... They were left at the end of the season needing to win every game. And for the most part, they had a real good run. They beat Envious, uh, which they needed to do. But here's the killer. You lose to Hellraiser's... In, in this super week, ultimately, for you, where you've got to win all of these games, you lose to Hellraisers, not once, but twice. And that is just not the NIP that we're used to talking about. You know, they had a 16-13 loss on cash, a map that they always profess to be good at. Um, so there's that. And then they, uh, I think, it, what was the other map they lost on? Dust 2. In overtime to Hellraisers, so just really <clears throat> frustrating because those two wins right there, that that coupled with the fact they beat Envious in the same week, that gets them there. That puts Envious yep. out, and they haven't. It been should able have been doable. Win. Yeah, absolutely. It was there for them. Um, the problem is when you looked at that stats page that Sam had up a minute ago, where it was the standings. Every team above them, look at the round difference. And everyone else is in like the 70s, the 60s. Nip was on like 30. So they were, they were, yep. they they weren't going to get in, but they were going to sneak in. They would have just made it. And by the way, look at fucking Fnatic's round difference there. Fnatic used stand-ins in this league, and they have a 146 round difference over the league. Like, yep. holy shit. But anyway, yeah, Nip, basically, it's true. The way was open. They'd done the hard lifting, and then they fucked it up against Hellraisers at the end. So... You'd like to say, oh, that's a good sign. Like they, they did beat a lot of the good teams. Yeah, but then the reason you didn't get in is you, you didn't beat a team that, in theory, should have been a definite win for you. So that's actually worse in some ways. I, would, I wouldn't have been as sad if I was them if I'd lost in the last game to Fnatic and it, you know, it'd been a close game or something. So obviously the four teams from Europe are going to be Fnatic, Virtus Pro, TSM and Envious. We won't talk about Envious or TSM. <clears throat> we have a tendency to do those two to death week in and week out. But I do want to talk about Virtus Pro. They finish level on points with Fnatic. That's a ridiculous accomplishment. 
uh, given how, the strength and depth of the league. Hellraisers went on a ridiculous run of form at the end. You've got Na'Vi in there. You've got Titan. You know, there's teams that realistically you would say are close to Virtus Pro, but actually Virtus Pro finished joint top effectively, second uh, only on round difference. So Virtus Pro are going to be coming in pretty hot right now. You know, like I, I, are we going to see some sort of second coming? From from Virtus Pro is is this going to be a phase where we really need to start considering them as an elite level team again? I think I think they're around there. The thing with Virtus Pro is, I mean, much like Nip and other teams that have kept the same lineup for a long time, they're never going to just suddenly jump five levels. But if you think about kind of their range at the moment, it does feel like they can go to the top end of their range, which means win an event, make finals, etc. Obviously, we haven't seen them at two lands in a row, which is weird. They're usually a very active team, so we haven't seen what their land form's like. But at the moment, their online form is very hot. As a team, when you think about Gfinity's coming up this week, this yep. should be an event they can win. So this could be, yeah, them returning to being like a third, fourth best team in the world with, the, with, with that crazy upside that they've always had of being able to win the event as well, which is what some of the third, fourth, fifth teams can't do. Mm. Um, obviously, Fnatic still... The dominant force. Nothing needs to be said there. Quick thoughts about the three teams, ultimately, that join NIP and missing out. Hellraisers, they seem dead and buried. They were like second from bottom at one point in the season. Yep. Had a phenomenal run uh, in the sort of second half, beating a lot of the top teams, doing a double over Nip there in the last week, uh, securing a win over Na'Vi, who they finished above, uh, obviously above Titan, so Hellraisers definitely deserve some commendation. And of course, while we're there and we're talking about Titan, Titan finishing fourth from bottom, just compounding their woes. So just some thoughts about these also rams. I mean, in terms of Hellraisers, Hell, it does feel like the main difference change in Hellraisers has been like some of the players have gotten like their form skill-wise individually back. And so they do have, they can be dangerous like on a map. Like we saw if, even at Fragbite where they didn't win a map, they can still play people pretty close. They can, online, they can be scary in best of ones, especially. But I can't think of any reason that would make them become a top team again. That's the problem. I think they're just going to be in that resigned to that category. Titan, I don't, I don't know. It, here's the weird thing about Titan. I actually feel like they're the team where online they're not very good. Even in group stages, they're not that good. They're like a series team to me. And series is when they can play all the top teams pretty close and they can win a map off top teams. So... Obviously, it's going to be hard if you have to qualify online to get to some of these lands. That's not going to help you. But I, I wouldn't be panicking that much about them because I don't, I don't know what more you would expect from their lineup at the moment. I think they're still, their strengths still exist in the same quantity, like good in series, good on certain maps, know, what, know how to play tactically. But I just don't think they're that good an all-round team that they're going to ever be very good online, especially um, not in an era where some of these teams exist. Yeah, And uh, just some thoughts about Titan. I mean, we've... Oh, it's much. Titan. I was talking about that. Oh, sorry. Yeah, um, not Titan. Uh, Dignitas. No, no, no. Uh, the Navi. Sorry, failing to get Na'Vi. into. Uh, yeah, failing to get into this top top four because we're talking about their overall yeah. improvement uh, earlier in the show. They're winning events. You know, they've got two titles under their belt this year. There's an argument to say they realistically should have been going uh, to these finals and and uh, and failed to do it. Um, is this? And anything they should be too worried about, you know, 50% win rate in a league made up of teams you would back them to to beat in best of threes uh, in an offline event. No, nah, because the problem is Navi's never really been known as some sick online team. Like actually some of those star series in the past that I've seen them qualify for were ones where they weren't even in the top four. They weren't even in the top five. They just went there because like other teams turned down the invitation. They just got in. They were never really known as beasts online. And secondly, the key thing about this league, which is, I think, why the quality of Fnatic, TSM, Vert's Pro showed out, is that the league lasts so long that it, it almost overcomes one of the things I don't like about online play, which is that it, it can be quite erratic in terms of short-term form. Yeah. So even though it is best of ones, you play so many and over so many weeks that even a, a team like Na'Vi catching fire in the last two to three weeks isn't enough to just instantly win you the league and get you a top four spot, you know? So I think actually the league has kind of, to a degree, shown out it has been about consistency, which is what you want a real league to be about. You know, it's like like the Premiership. You're not going to finish top four by just having a sick four-week span. You have to have been pretty good over the whole season. So I think that actually, if anything, Na'Vi's form 
has shown how just hot offline form where you have to be good for a weekend or two weeks and two weekends in a row won't get you a win in this league, which is it mm. has its ups and downs, obviously. Uh, and, and definitely got to say, uh, the league actually hasn't run particularly poorly. Uh, usually one of the problems with online leagues is a team enters it, even the high-level teams, they lose a few games, they're like, look, we're out of contention now, we'll just forfeit all our matches, really ruins it as a spectacle. That hasn't ha really happened too much here. Flip side, have obviously got the simple problem uh, going on. They have have had to forfeit some games, I believe. Uh, Penta um, have also had to forfeit some games because their roster got absolutely decimated. Uh, and Fnatic had, you know, had to use stand-ins on, on a few occasions. But for the most part, the league was played out uh, without, without any incident in, in Europe. So that's refreshing to see. You don't get that uh, all the time. Now, moving across to NA, <clears throat> obviously the four teams there that have qualified. Cloud9, no surprise. They only lost three games all season, top of the league. What we'd expect from the team we consider to be the number one NA, NA team. Keed Stars in second place, great showing by them. Um, Luminosity, third, yep, no doubt there. And CLG did it. They actually snuck in. Uh, level on points with Team Liquid, superior round difference, uh, and they just crept in right at the end. Now, we were writing CLG off at one point. You know, They were down there, they were below Liquid. Uh, Nihilum were obviously having that good run. This is one of the reasons, probably, is why Neil and are thinking, like, what the hell happened? It was, it's almost like the tortoise and the hare, you know? They, like, raced out. They were having great runs, you know? Only team that was really causing them problems was, like, Cloud9. I think Neil and even beat Keed Stars. And then, all of a sudden, CLG have just slowly plodded their way into that fourth spot. Um, so, just some thoughts about that. Yeah, unfortunately, as much as you want to give credit to... CLG, the first thing you have to say is it feels like part of it was a collapse from Neilum, and I think Neilum even know that themselves. The thing is, of the three, okay, so we had Neilum, Liquid, CLG, those were sort of the teams in the mix for that spot, because they'll have it kind of precluded themselves by getting rid of Desi, and, and they'd, already kind of, they'd already kind of dropped below at that point in time. Anyway, so you've got these three teams. Neilum seemed like the one that was the better one, but fell apart. Of CLG and Liquid, it doesn't surprise me that out of those two, it's CLG that made it because Liquid to me has some of the talent, but they don't know how to use it. CLG, I don't think is as talented, but I think they actually, at least I understand their style. They have like an identity, which is set. So for me, CLG sort of made it in by just holding holding serve as it were and Neilum fucking up and making the unforced errors, making the mistakes. And so in comes CLG at the last moment, but I don't really have high hopes for CLG at the LAN. Like I think at the actual LAN, every other team there you should have a reason to think that those other teams should do better. Because, I mean, you've got cloud Nines look dominant online. Keith Stars, has, I mean, they've got a very strong identity. I, I like, I love the way they play the game. And then Luminosity is the really hot team recently where every every roster move they've made has been the right one somehow. So I think everyone's got something over CLG at the moment. Yeah, I definitely see CLG as sort of the weakest of that top four. Um, and there's there's a real argument to say, quite rightly, there's there's no way they should have been there. Like, the, the collapse from the Hillam is... is quite spectacular you know it, it's it's like the air just deflating out of a souffle they've just fallen in on themselves um and you know they, they, despite that run of like i think it was six games they lost or something they uh they they're still only three points behind tlg i mean that's how atrocious uh that their, their, their run was right at the end um i don't see any of those teams mixing it up with the four from Europe, you know, maybe Cloud9, I suppose. I, I, I don't know, actually. I mean, maybe that's a bit unfair. The one thing you have got to say is that stylistically, I don't imagine Keyed Stars uh, will be much of a known quantity uh, in terms of how they play for a lot of the European teams. Same with Luminosity. Is there any chance that if the uh, Euros and you know, NA and Brazilians collide, there could be some upsets there? The problem is I don't know the format, but assuming something like a group stage, yeah, there's always the best of one upset chance where, because the key thing there is, what usually what allows those upsets is like the European team who was much better allows the lesser team to play on the lesser team's best map, thinking, well, we're better on that map anyway. That's like, that's like the recipe for how you get upset, you know, whereas 
when you know that that team has one or two good maps that they're even good on, then if you're the, the, the better team, you just ban that out and then you've pretty much taken care of business there. So that can definitely happen to some of these teams. I, I just wouldn't expect it to because they are upsets for a reason, you know. The, the better team has to lose for it to happen. So I would assume, unfortunately, that most of those NA teams aren't going to do very well, especially when you look at the teams we've got from Europe. And these are, these are basically like the gods of Europe. Yeah. I, I, I agree. I'm, I'm, I think, you know, it, it's going to be nice. You, you know, like last week, I got super excited at the prospect of seeing like a Chinese team in WCG. It doesn't take much to excite me, mate. You know? okay. just, just happy to be here. Just happy to be part of it, you know. Um, but I'm, I am looking forward to seeing, hope, and hopefully the format enables this, that we do get to see some of these unknown quantities like Luminosity take on a top European team. Uh, because I'd really, I'd really want to see that and see how they measure up, actually. Oh, and by the way, I hope yeah. nobody in NA complains about that fact that, like, oh, but what do you mean we're going to do badly at the LAN? Listen, fuckers, did you just see that new thing they introduced where you get money based on where you placed in the regular season as well? Yeah, So that yeah. means there's teams who are getting, like, $16,000 for placing fourth or something in the NA one. Yeah, look yeah. at Navi, etc., who didn't get that in the European one. Oh, you think your team would have beaten them? They wouldn't. <laughs> so you already had your benefit. You got your nice extra bit of cash in the online league. Yeah. Now go to Europe, take that beating that you deserve, and then yeah, let the man who's better than you, <laughs> your betters, let them reap the benefits it's, to, it's the, a very, to the victim it's a very or the point. spoils, N.A. It's a very I know you'd point. like it to be communist where everyone got equal share. What would Joe McCarthy think of you now, N.A. CSGO? What would he think? <laughs> But I mean, you know, CLG uh, have got more money than Navi, than Titan, than NIP, mm. than, than uh, they're joint with Envious in prize money, you know, and of course they have had a much you know, easier group stage. So it is a point worth making. One that I, I, echo I like that factor, things. though. It's, it is good that you also get. That's oh, another thing that was clever them, yeah. as an idea. Is say it was only to qualify for the LAN. Well, okay, well, when TSM locked up the LAN spot, well, they now have no reason to go ham on the last few games. They can even troll them if they want and just lose them on purpose. But if you make it so they win like $2,000 more for getting two, two spots above the fourth spot or something, well, now there's a reason to even play it. So it's actually quite a clever system. Also, as, as weird as it sounds, yeah, you should, probably should get something. I always thought in LCS, in League of Legends, you should get something for finishing first in the regular part before the playoffs anyway. It's still an accomplishment. You still have to do something. It's not the same as winning playoffs, but you should get a reward for excellence in the regular split. You know, So I like that. It's a good, it's a good system to add in, I think. Yeah, definitely. And of course, it makes every game significant, especially when you add the relegation component in. Yeah, yeah. Uh, flip side, obviously, drop out of the league in Europe. They've had a fairly wretched season. The simple problem continues to just... It, 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 I guess it's a good problem to have because they do have him as a player and ultimately his opportunities are limited, but they can't use him in this league and this league could have been lucrative. So they've definitely ran into some issues and they drop out the league. And of course, Ace, the Canadian uh, team, they uh, drop out as well in NA. So uh, we'll move on. We'll talk about what we're going to be doing this weekend uh, to wrap up the show. Of course, Gfinity is on the horizon. We're both going to be there as analysts. I'm not hosting, I'm analyzing, which of course I, I've forfeited all right to do, Duncan, because I'm not a player. I apparently don't watch Counter-Strike, apparently don't know anything about Counter-Strike. And just because I don't have your beautiful mind and can remember statistics from 2002, uh, I, I have no credibility. Nothing I say has any value. But I'm going to be doing but it again, anyway. But again, Rich, much like those NA teams, you do get that fat stack of cash. So exactly. enjoy it. I Take the fans beating and just go to the event, you know. <laughs> it's only a matter of time before I catch up to Scoots' bank balance, I'm sure. Um, so uh, let's talk about the teams that, that are there. Obviously, Fnatic have had to drop out. I think there's, a, an, again, more health problems, a player requiring some surgery. I'm not quite sure who it was, but they've had to withdraw. So Fnatic aren't there and TSM aren't there. So actually, it, it makes it interesting. It may not be the most competitive without those two teams, but actually, there's an argument to say it's going to be more fiercely competitive because all of the teams that are there, realistically, maybe bar one or two, they'll be aiming to win uh, and will be expecting, I imagine, to win. So you've got NIP, you've got Envious, you've got Titan and Virtus Pro. But where it starts to get interesting is down here. Obviously, Cloud9 are there as well. We're going to get to see Mouse Sports, uh, which I, you know I'm, I'm pretty sure they're going to be the whipping boys of this particular outing. But we're also going to see Dignitas, who... Showed some signs of improvement at uh, DreamHack Summer, it must be said. <clears throat> and, of course, SK Gaming, 
with a new in-game leader and no Hunden. No Hunden. So they've, they've already improved their position by a fifth. So um, just some thoughts about this. Uh, who should be aiming to win? Why? How do you expect it to go? For me, like the categories are like this. If you're envious and Virtus Pro, you must win this event. If you don't win this event, your legitimacy as like a potential one day world number one is, is very much called into question because the teams that normally would beat you aren't here. So those two must win the event. Nip must make the final. If they can't make the final of a tournament like this, I don't want to hear any crying about like, oh, it's people, people try and make out like we're not that good. You're not that good. If you can't make the final of this tournament, there's no Fnatic, there's no TSM here. These teams should be beatable for you. Not, I don't, I'm not saying you will win, but you should have a good chance. Then you go to like Titan, it has to be playoffs minimum, probably has to be final for them as well. Because if they can't make the final of an event like this, how are they ever going to make like a major final? How can we ever really put our hope that everything will come together and they'll have the sick run? They're already teetering on the edge of becoming just like an average top European team. Cloud9, I think for them, I don't have to have a crazy one for them. For them, I think they just have to try and make the playoffs. Like the group they're in is hard. If they can make the playoffs, that alone is a good statement, like especially from that group. And, and it kind of like builds on something from what they've been doing since they got the new lineup. For the others, all the rest of the others, I feel like, like actually Dignitas, just because Titan are there, they have an opportunity. They can maybe, they, maybe yeah, they can upset them, maybe they can make the, the semi. For SK and Mouse, unfortunately, they're just also runs. Like, I can't see a world in which they're going to get out of the groups here. So, for them, just show good games, try and win a map. You're probably not going to get out otherwise anyway, though. So, for those ones, though, but they're not they're not considered top teams. So, for, they, they have nothing to lose, basically. I won't look down on SK and Mouse if they finish last. I'm expecting it, you know. Yeah, I, I agree with that. So, wild cards, uh, you know, Cloud9, they've been to a few of these Gfinities now. Uh, we keep saying the sleeper must awaken. They've had a great run in the ESL and ESEA Pro League. Are they ready for European opposition? I actually have a video that I'm releasing on this today. I don't think so, basically. Like, I think best case scenario is to make the playoffs. And I think, realistically, they probably won't. So I, I would assume they'll lose to Envy's and Verse Pro, and that will be the end of the story. For, they for might a play, there, play I thought well. you were going to say, oh, I've got a video of them playing, and they're shit, mate. I've, just, I've been yeah. secretly filming them, something like I that. I wish I had. No, the problem with Cloud9 is, yeah, I can't see any reason why they would be. Like, even dominating NA isn't, doesn't, unfortunately, dominating NA doesn't make me think, right, well, that means you'll definitely be envious and versus pro. Like, there's no connection between those two, unfortunately. So, yeah, it's going to be hard. Those teams, especially because those two teams in particular are known to have a lot of firepower. It's not like, you, like, if you, here's the thing. If Cloud9 had been the other group where, where Dignitas is and they had Titan, now maybe it's possible. Maybe you could upset Titan. Maybe Titan could play poorly and, hey, maybe you could even have the most skilled players in that game with Skadoodle and Shroud going off. But Envious and VP are pretty skilled teams and they're, they're top teams. So I think that's a very bad gr group draw, actually. So I, I don't see it happening for Cloud9, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I'm going to be interested in this one. I kind of think this Nip have to, have to win this now. For me, this is like what I'm, what you know, what I'm thinking. Like, I think Titan. This is probably going to be the moment where whoever's in charge of Titan realizes we need to put the wounded animal to sleep. Like, it's got to be put down. Like, I think this is going to be it's going to be a watershed moment for a number of teams <clears throat> because I, I definitely agree with your observations that you know guys at Virtus Pro and Envious. They've got to be like in the final, right? I mean, they've got to be winning this. Uh, otherwise, you're right. Their legitimacy is questioned. But one team goes there with a particular monkey to get off their back, and it's NIP. If they don't win this tournament, they have got to accept changes are required. They've just got to bite the bullet. And they need, they need to have that awkward conversation, like who's going to go? Because on paper... With, with Envious's sort of offline form, Virtus Pro being erratic, the fact that they're in such an easy group, so their first day of game should be like a cakewalk for an IP. They should be coming into the, the crunch games more refreshed than their main counterparts. I, I, I just think they, they've really got to be thinking, yeah, we, we are the winners. We're already the winners of this tournament. If they don't win, I, you know, I can, and, and they, if they don't make changes, at that juncture, I, I would sort of start to struggle to justify their decision-making process. Um, and equally for Titan, I, I think there's a real chance that Dignitas could pip them in that group. Because I think Titan are all over the place right now. And even, you know, you saw at DreamHack Summer yourself, even with Kenny S back in the house, like a best tournament he's played in a long time. 
and they still can't they still can't buy wins against opposition that they should crush. Uh, again, they're in a similar position to NIP in the sense that there's organize, uh, organizational pressure and speculation surrounding that team that can't make it very easy for them. But this is the business we're in. So uh, I, I definitely think g Finity will decide the future, secure the fate of at least two of those teams. Anything else would be inconceivable. I mean, in terms of NIP especially, it's it's not just like this. It's that this will be like the last straw because you think of the recent form they had. Last Gfinity, they didn't get out of the group. Yep. Then they had um, DreamHack Summer. They made they went out in the semis, but primarily because they got upset and as a result had to play the best team, so they didn't make a final there. Then they didn't even qualify for SEA recently, the ESL Pro League. And now if they were not to even make the final or something like that here, I mean... That's like the that's that's all you need there. There's the four bad results in a row. That that's where it's like, okay, guys, what do you know that we don't know that you don't have to make roster moves? Like every other team has to make roster. Everyone else is made of humans who sometimes stop being good at the game and you have to replace them. Apparently, you guys think you can last forever without doing it. I, I think even they couldn't really hide any at any point there. You know, they've tried everything. Yeah. Well, and, and, and the fact that you bring exist back to calling when it was the previous Gfinity where I think they decided to drop Exist for calling, you've gone full circle between events now. You know, you're back to where you started. If you don't win the tournament now, then you've got to accept you no longer have the, uh, the, 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 the means, you no longer have the tools to fix the problem with what you've got. You've got to go out and get down to home base and buy something else, basically. Well, they've, they've, here's the thing. You know, in a sense, you can, I can see the logic of what they did. It's what they did last time before they removed Fifth Laren. They, by changing everything, by changing positions, changing maps you play, changing in-game leader, what you're doing is you're testing all the variables. You're trying to find out where's the error here. Well, if you change everything like that and you find out that there's actually fucking errors everywhere, well, then you have to change some, aren't you? You can't stick with what you've got at the moment. There's no way of fixing it at the moment. It already is what it is, you know. I don't know what the improvement they thought was going to get from it. But hey, maybe they win the event and this starts to turn it around. It's going to be one of the two, I see. It's either the end of this era of NIP or it's the magical revival that eventually they did get all together. I, mm. I'm obviously weighing more towards the former. So uh, what you guys can do at home, uh, if you've enjoyed this show, which I'm sure you have because you're still watching. And if you're watching it in VOD, I'm talking to you through time. Uh, you can follow me and Duncan at Gfinity. He's going to leave the waifu behind, uh, for only briefly. Or you maybe you, you could probably bring her with you if you want, mate. It's up to you. Uh, and fly all the way from Korea to London just to do one event and then fly all the way back. Ridiculous. The, the man is a machine. Uh, and what you can do is you can go over to alphadraft.com, start drafting some players, get involved. There's uh, multiple uh, to tournaments going to be revolving around all the big events, which includes Gfinity. Already paid out $5 million this year. Uh, in payments um, so you know you'll be able to get your chunk of change if you join in now i just want to end the show on something duncan now, i always like to end on a funny just like the news All so right. on reddit right <laughs> there was uh, a thread talking about last week's show yeah and uh when we when we talked about the uh, jw Possibly leaving fanatic rumor that was circulating. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. First, I just want you to confirm on air that is that was a rumor circulating. Yeah, yeah. we didn't we didn't fabricate that. Yeah. In fact, the whole point of this thing is this show is literally determined by what happens in CS. That's what we, our topics are. We're not just coming up with creative shit like, oh, yeah, what if Nip actually secretly wanted to bring in that Vox player? Like, this has to be real stuff, otherwise, yeah. we're not going to comment on it. So. Basically, I, I, I saw the thread on Reddit, JW to NIP, and uh, the, the reaction was unreal, it, as you'd expect. Um, it's also worth is, pointing out, we didn't, we didn't say JW's going to NIP. We said no, there was rumors that players are going to move. Who's the most obvious one? Again, it was speculation, yeah. but we directly labeled it as speculation. Yeah, I couldn't have qualified it anymore. Like, you know, but uh, yeah, there was some... There was some comments, you know, like, oh, they're even making their own rumors to sell the show. Apparently, we get paid on our viewer numbers. So what we have to do is okay. we have to make outlandish scenarios to attract viewers to the show. Um, so, yeah. So I just wanted to sort of address that, mate. And um, I, what I'll say is I'll, this is always the straight dope. We probably talk about things we actually shouldn't uh, ultimately because, you know, we hear these things because we're in a privileged position. We go to events. We get to hear all the gossip, all the people talking by the water cooler. Very often we're at the water cooler having those same conversations. 
I, you know, I certainly, I, I don't know about Duncan, I certainly can't be in the business of just making shit up. That kind of undercuts what I do for a living. So we're trying to bring you the straight dope. Like, that's what we want to do. You know, there you go. Plus, think about, get, get think about the rumors. Like, these rumors wouldn't be that good if you made them up. Like, if I was going to make up a rumor just to fuck with people, then I'd be like, oh, I get right, actually told me secretly that he knows that nip shit. And he actually thinks all the fans are fucking plebs, actually, that they just, like, keep buying all that nip gear. And he's like, I hope they choke on those chips, actually. Like, obviously, that's not real, is it? Like, that would be the funny shit I'd make up. I wouldn't just make up some rumor, like, Hunden will be kicked from my XMG. Like, who yeah, gives yeah. a shit? Like, has to be real. But uh, but yes, yeah, so that is that was the rumor that was going around, guys. And we are going to address uh, rumors when we sort of hear about them. You know, not always. We don't want it to be that kind of show. Uh, but uh, we're definitely going to talk about them. And you've got to realize we're always qualifying it. We're not saying it's a fact. We're saying this is a rumor. It cannot be more clearly labeled. If you are incapable of grasping that, then you know, get back to school. Just brush up on your English. So there you go. There you go. That's. It's out of my system now, mate. I'm out. My grandstanding is okay. over. So look, I know it's late where you are, so I'll let you go. I'll let you get back to being in bed, lying down with your chest hair out, recording those super creepy but somehow arousing videos that you like to do. Uh, any final thoughts from you? Uh, I'm looking forward to Gfinity. I mean, I actually like the fact, in a weird way, that because it doesn't have the top teams, it's the most wide open event I can think of in a long time. Actually, I mean, even that Star Series on paper should have been an envious win, but. I think this one, you, there's legitimately three teams at least can win this event. Maybe it can even be expanded after, after we see this week. Yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. Super exciting event. Looking forward to seeing you there, jet lagged and miserable, more miserable than usual. Uh, that's going to be a lot of fun. And of course, we've got Scoots there, the Taskmaster, whipping us both hard. So it's always emotional. Don't believe all this Gfinity's Angels bullshit. What goes on behind the scenes? It's anything Who will but Angelic. First? Yeah, exactly. It's always a battle to see which one of us is going to snap first. So we will see. Anyway, thanks for your thoughts today, Duncan. I'll let you get some rest. See you in London on the weekend. Thanks to all of you for watching. And uh, of course, may all your drafts be alpha. Peace. <laughs>